Hello, welcome back to Let's Play Jane's Fighters Anthology as we continue with uh, going through the Jane's reference section. Today will be the A7E Corsair, which has uh, one less page than the A7A. Uh, it's mostly going to be a repeat of the first one, but it will also have some unique stuff in it that um, is really the reason why I'm going through these. And again, I really wish I could show the photo albums and the, the detail views. Um, it's really disappointing that those uh, don't work, so I'll have to figure out why. But um, we do have access to these videos. So today, let's go through the A7E Corsair 2. Again, as of 1999 this time, instead of, you know, 2019 or whatever, whenever I last. No, no, I think I went through these, what, probably back around 2018, give or take? been a while. The series has been up for a while now. Uh, but in any case, the A7E Corsair 2. Title, Vought A7 Corsair 2. Type, carrier-borne and land-based subsonic single-seat tactical fighter. Program, on the 11th of February 1964, the U.S. Navy named the former LTV Aerospace Corporation winner of a design competition for a single-seat light attack aircraft. The requirement was for a subsonic aircraft able to carry a greater load of non-nuclear weapons than the A4E Skyhawk. To keep costs to a minimum and speed delivery, it was stipulated by the USN that the new aircraft should be based on an existing design. The LTV design study was there, based, therefore, on the F-8 Crusader. An initial contract to develop and build three aircraft under the designation A7A was made on the 27th of September 1965. Design Features Cantilever High Wing Monoplane Wing Section NACA 65A007 In Hedro 5 degrees, incidence negative 1 degree Wing sweep back at quarter cord 35 degrees Outer wing sections fold upward for carrier parking and in the A7H to allow best utilization of revetments at combat airfields one piece all moving tailplane, swept back 45 degrees at quarter cord and set at dihedral angle of 5 degrees 25 minutes. Flying controls plane sealed inset aluminum ailerons outboard of wing fold are actuated by fully triplicated hydraulic system. Leading edge flaps, large single slotted trailing edge flaps, spoiler above each forward wing, sorry, each wing forward of flaps. The tailplane is operated by triplicated hydraulic systems and the rudder powered by two systems. Structure, all metal multi-spar structure with integrity, sorry, with integrally stiffened aluminum alloy upper and lower skins. The fuselage is an all metal semi monoc structure, or monocoque, monocue. I should probably look up how to say that word since you see it a lot in aviation, but. A large door type ventral speed brake under center fuselage. The tail unit consists of a large vertical fin and rudder swept back 44.28 degrees at quarter cord. Landing gear, hydraulically retractable tricycle type with single wheel on each main unit and twin wheel nose unit. Main wheels retract forward into fuselage nose wheels aft. Main wheels and tires size 28 by 9 12. Nose wheels and tires size 22 by 5.5. Nose gear launch bar for carrier catapulting. Uh, sting, yeah, sting type arrestor hook under rear fuselage for carrier landings, emergency landings, or aborted takeoffs. Anti skid brake system. Power plant 1 Allison TF 41 A 2 Rolls Royce Bay non after burning turbo fan engine rated at 66.7 kN or 15,000 pounds thrust. The A7E has a pneumatic starter requiring ground air supply. A7H, TA7H, and A7K engines have self-start capability through the medium of battery-powered electric motor that actuates a small gas turbine engine, the jet fuel starter, which in turn starts the main engine through the gearbox. The engine has self-contained ignition for start, air start, automatic, relight, and selective ignition. Integral fuel in tanks in wings and additional fuselage tanks. Maximum internal fuel load 5,678 liters or 1,500 U.S. gallons or 1,249 imperial gallons. Maximum external fuel load 4,542 liters or 1,200 U.S. gallons or 999 imperial gallons. Accommodation pilot on McDonnell Douglas Escapec rocket powered ejection system with U.S. Navy life support system on the A7E and A7H. 
Escape System provides a fully inflated parachute three seconds after sequence initiation, positive seat man separation, and stabilization of the ejected seat and pilot, boron, as well as boron carbide cockpit armor. Avionics and equipment. The navigation weapon delivery system is the heart of the A7E-H light attack aircraft. It performs continuously the computations needed for greatly increased delivery accuracy and for maneuvering freedom during navigation to a target and the attack, weapon release, pull-up, and safe return phases of the mission. The system not only provides the pilot with a number of options during the navigation and weapon delivery, but also relieves him of much of his workload. The ASN-91V navigation weapon delivery computer is the primary element of the system. In constant conversation with basic electric, electronic sensors and computes, it computes and displays continuously present position using computed position and stored data to calculate navigation and weapon delivery solutions and monitors the reliability of data inputs and outputs. An ANASN-90V inertial measurement set in the basic three-axis reference system for navigation and weapon delivery, and an APN-190V Doppler, uh, Doppler radar measures ground speed and drift angle, and APQ-126V forward-looking radar provides pilot with nine modes of operation, air-to-ground ranging, terrain following, terrain avoidance, ground mapping, shape beam, ground mapping, pencil beam, beacon cross-scan, terrain avoidance, Cross scan, blah, 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 cross scan ground mapping, pencil, PV and strike integrated display system. ANAVQ 7V HUD receives and displays computed attack, navigation, and landing data from the tactical computer. Aircraft performance data from flight sensors and discrete signals from various aircraft systems. Armament A wide range of stores to a total weight of more than 6,805 6, kilograms or 15,000 pounds. Excuse me. Can be carried on six underwing pylons and two fuselage weapon stations, the latter suitable for Sidewinder air to air missiles. Two outboard pylons in each wing can accommodate a load of 1,587 kilograms or 3,500 pounds. Inboard pylon on each wing can carry 1,134 kilograms or 2,500 pounds. Two fuselage weapon stations, one in each side, can each carry a load of 227 kilograms or 500 pounds. Weapons include air-to-air and air-to-ground, anti-tank and anti-radar missiles, electro-optical TV and laser-guided weapons, general-purpose bombs, bomblet dispensers, rockets, gun pods, and auxiliary fuel tanks. In addition, an M61A1 Vulcan 20mm cannon is mounted in the port side of the fuselage. This has 1,000 round ammunition storage and selected firing rates of 4,000 or 6,000 rounds per minute. Strike camera in lower rear fuselage for damage assessment. Dimensions external wingspan 11.8 meters 38 feet 9 inches. Width wings folded 7.24 meters or 23 feet 9 inches. Wing cord at root 4.72 meters or 15 feet 6 inches. Head tip 1.18 meters or 3 feet and 10 and a quarter inches. Wing aspect ratio 4, length overall 14.06 meters or 46 feet 1.5 inches. Height overall is 4.9 meters or 16 feet and 3 quarter inches. Weights and loadings. Weight empty, 8,668 kilograms or 19,111 pounds. Max takeoff weight, 19,050 kilograms or 42,000 pounds. Performance. Max level speed at sea level, 600 knots or 1,112 kilometers per hour or 691 miles per hour. At 1,525 meters or 5,000 feet altitude, uh, it is unlisted <laughs> with 12 Mark 82 bombs. I assume these are at that altitude, though. Uh, 562 knots or 1,040 kilometers or 646 miles per hour. After dropping bombs, 595 knots or 1,102 kilometers per hour or 685 miles per hour. Takeoff run at max takeoff weight, 830 meters or 6,000 feet. Very range, max internal fuel, 1,961 nautical miles or 3,671 kilometers or 2,281 miles. Max internal and external fuel, 2,485 nautical miles or 460.4 kilometers or 2,000, or sorry, I think that's uh, 4,604 kilometers or 2,661 miles. Length, 
14.06 meters, height 4.9 meters, wingspan 11.8 meters, max takeoff weight 19,050 kilograms. Max level speed 600 knots, takeoff run 1,830 meters. That seems redundant. I don't know why they repeated that section. That's kind of repeating the top, so that's a little weird to me. Uh, 3D view, obviously they just recycled the same model. And, I mean, to be fair, you can get away with that, especially for a game with this level of visual fidelity. You know, your average person isn't going to be able to tell the difference between an A7A or a 7 e Corsair by looking at it, just like the average person probably wouldn't be able to spot the difference between, you know, uh, F-16A or F-16C, so I, I can't really fault them for this. You can see, uh, if we scroll back around to the other side, you can actually see... I like that little bit of shading in there. I think that's supposed to be, like, the, um, the blades of the intake, but... Alright, so can't click these because they'll crash, but we do have access to these videos, so please enjoy. First up, design. In May 1963, the U.S. Navy began a design competition for a new subsonic light attack aircraft which could replace the venerable A-4 Skyhawk. Four companies submitted proposals, and on February 11, 1964, LTV Aerospace and Defense, later a subsidiary of Northrop Grumman, was named the winner of the competition. LTV's successful bid relied on the F-8 Crusader design, although there were many significant changes. The new airplane, designated the A-7A, had a shorter fuselage with no afterburner, less sweep back on the wing, and no provision for varying wing incidents. Outboard ailerons were introduced, and the structure was strengthened to carry a max load of 15,000 pounds and eight stores. In fact, the A-7 could accommodate virtually every offensive weapon in the Navy's arsenal at the time. The Corsair first flew in September 1965, achieved operational status in February 1967, and the first A-7 squadron was deployed to Vietnam on December 4th of that same year. Subsequent models included the A-7D, adopted by the U.S. Air Force, and the A-7E Corsair II, which entered service in Southeast Asia in May 1970. Among the A-70 features were a more powerful engine, improved avionics, an M61 multi-barrel cannon, two Sidewinder AAMs, and advanced target recognition and infrared sensors. By production end in 1983, the Navy had equipped 22 of its squadrons with the aircraft. The legendary Corsair would not retire from the Navy's front line until well into the 1990s. All right, and then for our second video, the operational history video. When Operation Desert Storm was over, the A-7E Corsair's role as a frontline aircraft came to an end, but not before it delivered two million pounds of ordnance while flying 745 combat missions and totaling over 3,100 combat hours during that war. It was a fitting end to a proud and distinguished career as one of the Navy's premier carrier-based attack bombers. In frontline service from the late 1960s to the early 1990s, few combat aircraft could match the durability and reliability of the A-7 Corsair. Its multi-role missions included close air support and interdiction, precision ground attack, air defense suppression, sea surveillance, and search and rescue. In Vietnam, D&E model Corsairs flew thousands of combat missions with the loss of just a few aircraft to enemy fire. The planes also saw combat in Panama. During the decade of the 80s, the Corsair was systematically replaced by the F-A-18 Hornet, the most advanced strike fighter in the world at the time. Many Corsair squadron pilots had mixed emotions about the transition. Their loyalty to the A-7 was unquestionable, but at the same time, they were eager to tackle the challenges of a more aggressive and modern airplane. In the end, over 25 years and during six wars, the A-7 Corsair had flown on hundreds of thousands of sorties, the first in which its legend began, and the last from which it returned in triumph and to the end of active combat service. All right, so that concludes the A-7E Corsair 2 for today. Next time we've got uh, the A-10, and unfortunately, I think if we uh, go through here, uh, it looks like most of the aircraft that is not able by default to be controlled by the player do not have their separate videos, which is unfortunate. Some of them do have the detail views, which is, you know, great, except for the part... Oh, hey, this one. Oh, actually, what's the A? 
You gotta wonder if the A and C Vault Falcon videos are gonna be the same or not. Look at all of that. They got a maneuvers video. Oh man, I'm excited to go through these. And when you think about it, oh, uh, oops, I guess that's gonna be our ending story. But when you think about it, this cost them a lot of money to develop. Because, I mean, obviously, under some agreement, Jane's had to provide the, uh, the reference video. Or, or, well, yeah, the, they had to purchase all the video, probably, or, you know, I don't know what the nature of the agreement was between Jane's and EA. So maybe Jane's provided it free in exchange for a cut of the revenue or something. But to get all that video, all the documentary footage, to get all those tech specs, which they probably had to purchase, you know, at least one copy of the book for the developers to work with and program in, which, as I mentioned in the last episode, can cost thousands of dollars. And then to have someone narrate these videos, I mean, that this was probably more expensive to implement than the, um, or as expensive to implement as the Ukraine campaign. As you think about it, that was the, um, the most in-depth campaign in terms of, like, we had cutscenes and stuff, and there were actors, there were sets. You know, people aren't reading these lines for free. So... You know, and those cutscenes were generally short, maybe a minute or two at the most. And here we're getting two to three minute videos on maybe every third or fourth aircraft in the inventory. You know, that would be expensive, to, you know, relatively speaking, just to pay a voice actor to read through all those. So I applaud them for putting in that effort. I wish the campaign could have seen a little more of that effort, too, although not at the expense of this. Um, you know, but, uh, just the dedication, man. Don't really see that much in games these days. Like CMO, you know, they've got the database, but they don't have someone narrating it. They don't. Uh, any information supplemental to the stats is provided by the community. Um, and so it's purely optional. And of course, there's no one narrating it with these nice videos. So sometimes old games do it best. But in any case, that concludes our episode for today. So with that, thank you all for watching and stay tuned for next time and stay safe out there. And we'll see you then.